to the Neutral Ground Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Meyer. Well, we finally arrived at our current historical movement. We are in neo-modernism. But what does that actually mean? Where did it come from? Where is it going? We're going to answer these questions and more. Well, maybe not more. Maybe we'll just answer those questions. That's probably enough. Yeah. All right, let's jump into this. Okay, so in our previous two episodes of the podcast, we took a long look at postmodernism, and I tried to frame postmodernism in a fairly balanced way. However, historical movements seem to always leave somewhat of a bad taste in the mouth of the people. If you think about it, it's pretty much common sense. If people were not tired of the movement, we would probably still be in it. But as I said in the previous episode, postmodernism needed to die. It needed to go away so that we can work on restructuring how we approach sacred space. Now, really quickly here, let's just do a kind of a recap so that we can connect the dots a bit better. Postmodernism essentially breaks down to being a movement of skepticism. We were skeptical of institutions, of infrastructures, of religion, and then it really expanded to being skeptical of like language and even of meaning itself. And then I would argue it became skeptical of itself, and we became skeptical of ourselves. The potential good of postmodernism is that it can break down dominant cultural narratives in order to make space for individuals to fully participate in society. The civil rights movements in the 50s and 60s were most definitely aided by postmodernist thought, and that's not insignificant. The negatives of postmodernism, however, is that the skepticism of it has spiraled, I would say, both the collective and the individual into a kind of fractured state of mind, not all that dissimilar to what we saw in modernism and what Nietzsche predicted would envelop Europe for about a hundred years, a kind of nihilism. And we'll be addressing Nietzsche and nihilism in a later episode, so if you're interested, stay tuned for that. You can't live in skepticism. It destabilizes the psyche to a point that it becomes difficult to differentiate between reality and illusion. Now, when you feel you can't trust institutions, groups, language, and even the person next to you, when that rubber band of historical movements snaps, what are you left with? You're left with yourself. More than that, you're left in a kind of primordial state of chaos, needing to build yourself back into creation. If that doesn't make sense, I think it will by the end. So when does neo-modernism actually begin? Okay, this is kind of a tough question, and here's why it's difficult. When you do a surface-level dive into historical movements, you're always tempted to tie the beginning and ending of major movements with extreme events of violence. For example, World War I and modernism, and, you know, World War II and the beginning of postmodernism. But when you go a bit deeper, you begin to see that there already were smaller events happening that oftentimes led up to the larger event. Now, does that mean that the smaller events are the origins? Or do we use the larger events because they create a much clearer picture? And that's the problem. So let me give you my organic thoughts on this. And when I say organic thoughts, I mean I'm still kind of thinking them through as I'm saying them to you. (laughs) So bear with me if at times I have to kind of talk myself maybe in and out a little bit of a corner. Now, I want to be very clear. I did not in any way coin the phrase neo-modernism, nor am I the first person to establish that we are even likely in neo-modernism. There are early neo-modern critics who were interacting with the failings of postmodernism. One of the first critics to really take postmodern theories to task is Jürgen Habermas, And one of the main problems that Habermas has with the early postmodern theorists is that, well, kind of like what we talked about in part one 
of the episode on postmodernism. It has to do with clarity of thought and, to a degree, empiricism. Now, again, I'm going to draw from Stanford's wonderful Encyclopedia of Philosophy here because, look, they're just... They, they just put it a lot more succinctly than I can. I, I will talk myself around in circles uh, just to get to the point that I can order a salad at a restaurant. So let me, let me go ahead and quote them here and say, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, quote, Habermas argues that postmodernism contradicts itself through self-reference and notes that postmodernists presuppose concepts they otherwise seek to undermine, e.g. freedom, subjectivity, or creativity. In a nutshell, Habermas thinks that there's a lot of nonsense in the theory, mainly because it talks its way in circles to a degree, and by controlling the communication within that circle, by creating the very, the very objects in the discussion itself, it can never really be challenged, because you have to challenge the very concepts that they created. Does that make sense? So we have our first shots here fired at the bow of postmodernism. Habermas wants to bring enlightenment reasoning and science back into the picture. He wants concrete forms of discussion so that the conversation points can be better understood, challenged, and then either supported or torn down. But for Habermas, you, you can't actually socially evolve when you're in a state of circular, self-referential communication. And Habermas does make a strong case against postmodernism in his work, The Philosophical Discourse of Modernity, published in 1985 and translated into English in 1987. You also have early critics like Agnes Heller, and Victor Grauer, back in the 1980s, who also turned the skeptical eye of postmodernism, think, picture, I always picture Sauron's eye here. They kind of turn the skeptical eye of postmodernism on itself, and find much of it wanting. So there are individuals going back to the 1980s, actually, who are, I think, uniquely feeling the tension building in the rubber band, and seeing the inevitability of the violent snap that's going to happen. But again, I don't think you would say that neo-modernism as a historical movement begins in the 1980s. Rather, these individuals become almost like prophets of the movement, foretelling the coming of something new. I think the masses ultimately drive when a movement occurs, and there's nothing that moves the masses quite like media. And I believe one type of cultural subset of media has spurred on the drive to neo-modernism more than anything else. Have I mentioned I love studying the heroic narrative? Epics, comics, how the heroic tradition has evolved to fit the needs of the people in specific times. It's my belief that nothing has contributed to our move toward neo-modernism more than the resurgence of the superhero. This is not to say that people didn't love comics and superheroes and postmodernisms. Absolutely not. People love them. I'm one of them. You know, I'm a postmodern child, and I loved my comics. However, I'm going to make a case that the superhero in neo-modernism has, has transitioned quite a bit since postmodernism. The postmodern superhero was oftentimes complex blurring the lines of good and evil. And we yearned for that kind of complexity then, because remember that whole, like, skepticism thing in postmodernism? I mean, if you're within a movement that is skeptical of even being able to define what good and evil are as concepts, it's going to be difficult then to have heroes who aren't also in a kind of land of confusion here. Now, postmodern heroes will always have a place in the superhero genre because we mere mortals are complex creatures who are often in places where good and evil can seem blurred, right? But I have a question for you. Think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe for a second. Phase 
one through three. For those of you who might not be familiar with the whole phase lingo thing, that's roughly Iron Man 1 from 2008 through Avengers Endgame 2019. Think about how popular the MCU became from 2008 all the way through 2019. And here's my question. How much complexity or moral ambiguity is really built into those first three phases of the MCU? I'll pause for a minute. Really think about it. This is where you remember that I'm a teacher and I'm highly comfortable with uncomfortable pauses. <laughs> but I'll stop now. Now let's talk about why this Marvel Cinematic Universe really won people over. The gravity that held together the universe were really Iron Man and Captain America. And why? They created or established the boundaries from which the other characters could kind of play, right? They established the sandbox from which everyone else could be a bit more complex if they wanted to be. It's why Captain America's Civil War actually had genuine tension. Not because it was Tony Stark versus Steve Rogers, right? Like it was some kind of, oh geez, what's the name of those two, the two young guys from Twilight? Eric and Andre the Wolf. I forgot their names. Oh, boy. Anyway, it's not one of those situations where it's like, you know, this, it's just this heartthrob versus this heartthrob. There was genuine tension in that matchup between Iron Man and Captain America because they both genuinely believe in right versus wrong. That you needed to have strict definitions of good and evil. Okay, let me, let me pull back a moment here, because I think, now that I'm saying this out loud, I think we're going to need a separate podcast episode just on the amazing dilemma of Captain America Civil War. So, yeah, you can put that down in the books. I think we're going to have to have a podcast about that, about that movie. Now, my point, though, is that whether the people at Marvel knew it or not, they bucked the postmodern trend of heroic complexity by giving us two very straightforward heroes who had moral codes and who could voice with specificity what was right, what was wrong, what was good, and what was evil. The reason the masses of people who couldn't give a crap about comics or superheroes watched every movie and cried at the end of Endgame when Captain America lifts Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, is because we, as a people, already established that Steve Rogers was worthy. And seeing Mjolnir in his hand just reinforced that there was good in the MCU and that we could identify good again. It became tangible. And when Tony dies at the end of Endgame, we experience the loss of good. You know, something that, that just doesn't get talked about enough with Iron Man's death is that he is really clear that the only reason why he's even doing this is because he loves his family, right? That's the one thing he cannot... He, de he never wants to sacrifice his family. But in so many ways, he loves the rest of the world now because of his family, right? You've ever heard people who have kids. Sometimes they'll tell you, having kids taught me to be less selfish. And I think that's the case here with Tony Stark. I think having that family is what taught him that he needed to go help the rest of the world. And we watch him walk through that journey like a quest narrative. 
and we walk that journey with him. And deep down, we wanted to also walk that journey. Now, I'm not saying we wanted to die, (laughs) but what I'm saying is we wanted to walk that journey of valuing good so much that we would be willing to sacrifice everything for it. What the MCU in phases one through three did is they gave us a platform for believing in a collective narrative of good versus evil, something we desperately needed and yearned for as a collective people. Now you're probably thinking, um, Joe? You still haven't told us when you think this whole neo-modernism thing began. Yes, you're completely right. I have not done that. Hmm. However, there was a point to my seemingly meandering monologue. Superhero movies really started to come into their own in the 90s. Think of the X-Men films with Hugh Jackman, right? Late 90s, early 2000s. Then you had the Spider-Man films of Tobey Maguire. Specifically, Spider-Man 2 from 2004. Whoa, holy crap. That's like, wait, let me use my fingers. That's like 17 years ago. Wow. Anyway, the 2004 Spider-Man 2 had a really profound impact on the public. Dr. Octopus was a complex character in the postmodern sense. But rather than be a complex hero, Spider-Man rejects the complexity of managing a relationship with Mary Jane in that movie, and he embraces his calling to fight for good. And we do love him for that. We love him for that sacrifice. His sacrifice, again, is the presence of belief in good manifested into action. Then you have the beginnings of the MCU in 2008 with Iron Man. Now my argument, if you can't already tell, is that it is the superhero movie genre that ultimately ushers the masses into neo-modernism, into the, that public consciousness of neo-modernism. And there is so much that we currently crave as a people that is already manifested perfectly in the superhero narrative. The belief in good versus evil. The origin story as a means of recreating the self into something better. The importance of narrative as a means of communicating the human experience. The internal struggle with the self. The sacredness of space, right? The hero guards places even more than people because in choosing to guard a place, Metropolis, Manhattan, Gotham, you willingly take all that resides in the place on your shoulders. Again, think about Tony Stark's point in Civil War. He's upset because people within the space of Sokovia die. He feels responsible for those people because he was responsible for that space and the ability to transcend flesh and bone, to become aligned with a symbol in some way. Now, it's also my opinion that the the main reason why DC, you know, the other company opposite of Marvel, the main reason why DC's movies, their live-action movies at least, their cartoon ones, are phenomenal. Oh, they're amazing, the cartoon ones. But the, the live-action movies, the reason why I think they haven't done so well and why they can't seem to ever really get a good foothold on their own cinematic universe is because the public, not the die-hard comic people, again, the regular Joes of the world, are not interested in the emotionally complex stories that they are putting out there. Look, Superman is the ultimate non-postmodern hero. He's the Boy Scout. He's the perfect hero from which to launch your universe right now. And when Man of Steel came out in, uh, was it 2013, I think? 
It was far too dark and complex for the regular masses to enjoy. Therefore, no boundaries for good and evil were ever truly established in that DC universe. You could have done it, too, with Superman and Batman. Remember, Batman vs. Superman, right, that movie, was roundly criticized as being boring by the masses. But it wasn't really that it was boring. It wasn't. I would argue that it wasn't engaging. And that's not the same thing. Both characters were muddied by blurred lines of good and evil, and because of the blurriness of those lines, you not only were confused about whom you wanted to win, but even worse, you didn't care. And yes, I'm aware of Frank Miller's 1986 The Dark Knight Returns. I get that origin storyline, right, that they were kind of going for here. But you have to base your criticisms of the 2016 Snyder movie on how the cinematic universe was established. And it's not as if DC couldn't do this. The beauty of the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy is that as complex that it got at times, and, you know, in that kind of Nolan sort of way, it always reduced back to the simplicity of good versus evil. There was no equivocation about who you were rooting for in the battles between, you know, Batman and the villains, whether it was Ra's al Ghul, the Joker, or Bane, Miranda Tate. And that's why those movies did well. So I think we're starting to get a sense here through the superhero resurgence of what we're looking for in neo-modernism. And right now in my head, I've got it down to three very specific ideas. One, we need reassurance in narrative. Two, we need transcendence of the corporeal, the body. And three, we need sacred space. And that takes me to my second point here that I want to talk about in terms of neo-modernism, and that is a kind of resurgence of religious thought or religious transcendence in neo-modernism. Now, I'm going to be upfront here. I'm Roman Catholic. I've had my own struggles with belief, and I'll have more. However, as someone who does believe in God, I find it incredibly fascinating that even atheists, right, even people like Douglas Murray, are starting to see and even talk about the values, at the very least, that religion provides for individuals in terms of giving them a kind of space for getting out of the drudgery, the drudgery of, of humanity, or the getting out of the banality, if you will, of existence. In short, though, religion can provide all the items I just mentioned above as well, right? Reassurance and narrative, transcendence of the corporeal, and sacred space. But what I'd see, though, or I should say what I don't see, is I don't see the resurgence necessarily of religion popular, um, religion, how do I say this the right way? What I don't see is the resurgence in religion proper necessarily. In other words, like I don't think people are going to go out and, and start all of a sudden saying I'm going to be a Catholic, Episcopalian, a Muslim, Jewish, you know, Hindu, they're not going to, I think, run to religion proper right now. There could be, in the next historical movement, we might see that, actually. It makes sense. And maybe sometime in this podcast, we can even, not this episode, but another episode, we can even kind of talk through where we think the next historical movement might go. And I do have some ideas about that already, honestly. I don't necessarily think that we're going to see a run to religion proper, at least not right away, maybe in the back end of neo-modernism 
you're going to see that. Because again, I do think people are going to be craving those three things that I mentioned, the narrative, transcending the corporeal and the sacred space. People are going to continue to yearn for that in neo-modernism. And I'm not sure that you can find it necessarily anywhere else. But in a kind of religious context, I'm completely willing to be wrong on that. But I don't think I am. Now, are these ideas good or bad? Well, again, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Movements are not really good or bad, and it doesn't really help to look at them that way. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. The facts of life. So let's think for a moment here and try to parse out some of the potential good and some of the bad here by taking all of this over to the neutral ground. Okay, so let's look at the first one, reassurance of narrative. What's good here? Well, narrative reassurance allows us entry into the realm of belief, and belief is a stabilizing force for the human race. Now, I'm not even necessarily talking about religion here. I just mean belief in things like human life is important, that we should strive to be good human beings, etc. Having beliefs challenges us to also maintain cognitive stability. What I mean is that if you live in a constant state of skepticism and distrust in all things, your mind is going to experience constant states of dissonance. It's definitely harder to establish clarity of thought when you're in this dissonant mindset. Therefore, when something does come to mind and creates a kind of cognitive dissonance, belief is what gives you the means by which you can test your dissonance for whether or not it's something that needs to be absorbed into your system of beliefs in some way or dismissed. What about the transcendence of the corporeal? Well, human beings are always being reminded of the limiting state of our mortal form. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Am I right? Why were the theologians like Augustine so fascinated by the battle between body and spirit? Because the ability to manage and at times overcome your primordial drives is in some ways the very essence of discipline. You don't have to believe that the body is evil. However, I don't think we can completely deny that there are times when our body drives us towards something that we consciously know is going to be detrimental to us in the long run, maybe even destructive. Yet, is there any one of us who does not know intimately what it feels like to lose a battle with the body? I do. Therefore, how do you ever overcome those drives? It's not just through discipline. It's through transcendence. It's in arriving at a place where you keep the body in check with the rest of you. Now, there are times when you need to listen to what your body is telling you. But when the body is always talking and dictating to you, you can end up in a kind of boy-who-cried-wolf situation where you can't distinguish when the body is telling you something important or when it's just crying for some pizza. Oh yeah, pizza sounds great right now. Let's take a look at the, the possible good here in terms of sacred space. It's my belief that much of the strife we see now in the larger public conversation has to do with the fact that people are trying to build their own individual narratives of sacred space. And when something is sacred, you are called to defend it. Having a sacred space allows us access to a place, whether it's in our minds or a temple, mosque, synagogue, or even a garden. It gives us a place from which we can experience the metaphysical world, something that has been a part of just about every civilization known to man. 
But why do we need this? Because there's something within us, a feeling, a calling, that believes that there is something bigger than we are. For some, it's a god. For some, it's science. Let's not forget that scientists often experience a kind of metaphysical calling through their curiosity to uncover something greater than what we already know. That is a kind of metaphysical transcendence, a sacred space from which they can theorize why we're here and how we got here. The sacred space is necessary for us to parse out big questions of existence and to try and clarify our own state of being and our relationship to cosmology. We can't do that successfully if everything is open for mockery and derision, like it was in postmodernism. And what are the potential problems that we're going to see, and or that we are already seeing in these? Well, reassurance of narrative can lead people toward factioning, toward separating people into those who believe and those who don't thus creating more sites from which we can fracture ourselves as a people. Narratives can also lead to violent actions. How do tyrannical states lead entire countries into war and hatred? Largely through narrativization. The potential negative of transcending the corporeal is that we forget the importance of the here and now. While you're transcending into the clouds, you have your family friends, responsibilities here on earth that still need your attention, your love. Transcendence is movement, and you can move yourself right out of humanity if you aren't careful. Finally, as I kind of already mentioned, I think we're starting to see some of the potential negatives of developing sacred spaces. You can build up a sacred space that is so ideally suited to you that no one else can enter it, thus leading you to feelings of extreme isolation and defensiveness. Because if you feel that all you have is your own sacred space, if that's the only part of this universe that you feel you can control, you will defend that space at all costs. And that can remove you from the greater part of society. Well, that was a lot of information. I think I'm going to stop the episode there. I think that's probably 